Today, I'm going to talk about one of the most fundamental problems in computer vision, um, 3D reconstruction, which I got uh, very excited about recently, and in particular, how we can use deep learning technology in order to improve on what we have so far. So what is 3D reconstruction? 3D reconstruction is the problem of given a set of uh, 2D images that depict an object or a scene to reconstruct the 3D shape of uh, that object or that scene that is depicted there. 3D reconstruction is the inverse problem of the um, computer graphics, the forward rendering process, basically, right? And because a lot of the information um, that is available in 3D is lost after the projection process, it's a highly ill-posed problem. So there's a lot of ambiguities when you do the 3D reconstruction. And so you need to use a lot of prior assumptions about the world we live in. And so the question is, how can we encode these prior assumptions? And we'd like to use data and deep learning for this, right? Um, 3D reconstruction has a lot of applications, um, ranging from intelligent systems like autonomous vehicles, uh, trying to understand the environment, the geometry in order to navigate, to archaeology, to um, uh, medical uh, uh, applications, and, and many more. So it's, it's a really broad spectrum. Okay, so how does a, a typical 3D reconstruction pipeline look like? So the input is a set of images. Um, and the first thing that is typically done is estimating the camera poses. So what you do is you try to uh, match features, sparse, you find a few sparse features in the images that correspond to each other, and then you solve uh, what is called the bundle adjustment problem, which solves for the structure, the 3D point location, and the camera poses together. And this is a really, pretty well-established technique. So out comes the camera locations, as well as a very sparse 3D reconstruction. Now we want to have a dense free reconstruction, of course. So the next step is um, for each of the images, so here you can see one of the images, um, we want to get a dense depth map. And we do this by shooting a ray through every pixel that projects into lines onto the other images. And then on these lines, we find correspondences. So we try to find the pixel that looks closest to the uh, pixel in the input image. And if we do this, we get a set of depth maps. So for each of the input images, we have a depth map. But that's not uh, a full 3D reconstruction. This is just 2.5D reconstruction. So what is done then is uh, to fuse these depth maps to a full 3D reconstruction of the scene. And uh, one of the um, gold standard methods to do that is the Curlis and Levoy uh, volumetric fusion approach. And the idea there is to take the 2.5D depth maps to project the depth information into the 3D space and uh, then to calculate an implicit surface representation by going through every voxel in the 3D space and measuring the distance to the closest surface. Now you do this for every of the uh, input images, for every of the depth maps, and you fuse all this information by simply averaging this implicit representation, and then from that extracting a, a zero level set out again, which gives you the surface. And so you, you, you have the final reconstruction there. So I'm going to focus in this talk on the bottom part here of this pipeline, on the depth map fusion process and how can we make this better. The problem with the standard depth map fusion process is that it doesn't take advantage of all the 3D data. It doesn't know about the world we live in, about the complex geometries and, and the appearance of these geometries that we see typically. So it's a, it's a very simple way of, of, of fusion. It cannot, for instance, it cannot complete missing surfaces, cannot reason about occluded regions, and also it, it, it needs a lot of data to actually reduce noise and, and it will replicate outliers. It cannot reason about outliers because it doesn't know about geometry. So we want to use deep learning, and deep learning requires large 3D data sets. But these become um, more and more available these days. So here are a couple of examples. So these are data sets that are recorded with a Kinect scanner, whole apartments, even whole uh, uh, buildings. Um, but also there is data sets uh, like ShapeNet um, derived from Google Warehouse, where there's a lot of 3D CAD model information available, which we'd like to leverage to learn. Uh, 3D reconstruction from data. So the guiding question is talk is, can we learn 3D reconstruction from data? And in that context, I'd like to present two recent projects that we did. The first one is about how can we actually efficiently model um, 3D convolutional neural networks. Um, and that's something we presented at CVPR this year. And the second project is then uh, how can we use these representations to do 3D reconstruction with them? And that's something that we've actually presented uh, three days ago on Tuesday um, at a 3D Vision Conference. So 
I guess I don't need to explain to this audience that we have, a, a, like, this, see all this revolution today, right, in AI. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a big buzz because these things are really starting to work. But what we see is that the success is mainly happening in, uh, in 2D. So, for instance, the input is an image, and then we have, you know, for instance, a confnet where we have convolutions and pooling operations, and in the end, some fully connected layers that output a class label. And it does it extremely well, but the input is only 2D. So how can we go to 3D inputs then? <clears throat> so um, the naive way, um, as here uh, in the VoxNet approach, is to simply, um, instead of having 2D convolutions, uh, use 3D convolutions, right? So here's a 3D confnet where we have also convolutions and pooling operations stacked on top of each other. But the problem with this is simply that it doesn't scale very well. So um, if you look at this chart, this is memory, gigabyte versus uh, input resolution, you see that if you have a Titan X, then you can only process um, resolutions up to 64 cube, which is clearly not enough to do uh, 3D reconstruction applications with that. Now, maybe you got lucky and Jensen got you a DGX1, right? But uh, not everyone is in that situation and, and still, like this is not scalable. So we want to have something that's more scalable. Now, one observation we did is that 3D data is actually often very sparse. It's not true for all the data. It's sometimes not true, for instance, for medical images. But if you look at this point cloud from the Kitty autonomous car, it's very sparse. Only little uh, points are actually occupied. Similarly, if you look at meshes, um, and if you voxelize meshes at finer and finer resolutions, for instance, here, you can see that only 2.4% of the uh, voxels are actually filled, namely the voxels that are at the surface. So it really makes no sense to do a lot of operations, waste a lot of operations in areas where there is no information in the input, right? So the question is, can we exploit sparsity, this uh, sparsity um, properties for efficient deep learning? <clears throat> and I want to illustrate this with a simple uh, motivational example here. So what you see here is a, uh, the output, the maximal value at each voxel of the absolute value of the activation, of the feature activation. So over all the feature maps, uh, the maximum. Um, and you see this, uh, so this is a classification network that has convolution and pooling operations and in the end tries to classify an input shape as bed or airplane or something, right? And uh, you can see that um, these, uh, like, I mean, this is uh, different resolutions because this is before the pooling step, this is after the pooling step, this is after another pooling step, right? So if we look at a slice through this, you see even more clearly that uh, a lot of the space is actually has no activations, and it's clear why, because many of these operations in convolutional neural networks are actually very local, like pooling is a two by two by two operation, convolution typically three by three by three, right? So it happens very locally, so there is no information far from the surface. So it really doesn't make sense to discretize this uniformly. So what we do instead is we partition it adaptively. Uh, we use a technique uh, called octrees, which is from, uh, used very heavily in the graphic, uh, graphics literature. And what we do is basically we take the input and we subdivide the cells only where we have information such there is big cells um, far away from the surface and little cells close to the surface where we want to be more accurate. And this is all derived from the input, right? We, we take the input mesh and, and, and uh, tessellate accordingly. Now we have this representation, but we need to define um, all the standard operations of confidence on this representation. So we cannot just apply naively a standard uh, um, architecture, a standard framework, because it would just not work on that representation, so we define our own. The first thing we need to implement is a convolution operation. So here is uh, the input feature maps on this data adaptive representation, and we have a convolution filter that we swipe over, and uh, it basically convolves it with this feature map and outputs another an output feature map here. But what you can see here is that now, inside a single cell, we have different activations because uh, information from the adjacent cells leaks into that uh, cell. But we explicitly want to avoid that, right? We want to uh, represent that information more costly because it's far away from the surface. So how can we do it? How can we summarize this information? Well, the standard way to do that is to do pooling, right? And we do average pooling here. Uh, and let the network learn, so it's fully differentiable, it uh, allows for end-to-end -end training, uh, and we let the network learn how to best do this, right? We, t we only tell the network, well, use less information further away from um, where there is input information. This operation can be implement implemented very efficiently, so um, there's four different cases here, and uh, if we have, for instance, this case here where we have a lot of empty space, then we can do the evaluation very, very fast. So we also gain something computationally. Um, similarly, we can define pooling operations. So if you want to pool these little cells here, um, we pull them together, and then we adapt the data structure. So we put all the data one level up in the oak tree um, um, to give the output of the pooling operation, and similarly, we can define the unpooling operation. So 
let's look at some results of this architecture, of this framework. The first thing we look at is the standard problem, 3D shape classification. The input is a 3D shape as a mesh. We voxelize it. We push it through a confinite architecture, an octnet architecture, and the output is a class label like airplane or something else. So here, this is a simplified illustration. In practice, we have more um, layers, of course. So uh, this is a simple encoder architecture. And the first thing we look at here is now um, the memory requirements, right? So we compare to the dense network that we have seen before, the green curve. And we can see that now, even at uh, 256 cube resolution, we can still process on, on, a, on a Titan X, for instance. Um, similarly, we also get a little bit improvement in terms of uh, runtime um, for the higher resolutions, but we have a little bit of overhead for the smaller resolutions, right? So for the smaller resolutions, we, we use a dense network anyways, so um, that doesn't affect uh, the overall architecture. So then the next question to ask is, well, by this approximation that we do, do we actually lose something? And this is illustrated here. So this is accuracy versus input resolution, and again, the dense network versus the oct network, and you can see that the, the curves are almost on top of each other. So we have uh, roughly the same performance, right? So we, the good thing, good news is we don't lose anything. So that's great, right? We thought now we can really go uh, and uh, do shape classification at high resolution and should be much, much better than everyone else, um, but it turns out not to be the case. <laughs> so um, this is basically, we, we tried various architectures. You do what you do, right? You do student gradient descent, and you try different type of parameters, and uh, you, you end up with some architectures that work better than others. And um, what you can see here is that the performance levels out after a certain resolution. And the reason for this is that some of these classes in the data set are actually very easy to distinguish already at small resolution, like bathtub versus bed. And this is the majority of the classes, while a, a very few classes are really difficult to distinguish, even for human, at very high resolution, like dresser versus nightstand. Okay? So let's look at another task where it might help more. <clears throat> so this is a 3D semantic labeling. Here the input is a 3D point cloud, a colored point cloud. We voxelize that color point cloud. That's what you see on the left here. And on the right here, you see um, the output of the network. This is um, basically the semantic class labels like a window, wall, roof, um, vegetation, and so forth. Now in order to solve this task, we have a different architecture. Using our framework, we have a, a unit, which is basically an encoder, decoder architecture with skip connections, because the output is not a, a class label, a single value. It's a, it's a whole, like, a structured output, right? Um, so we have convolutions and pooling and unpooling and uh, convolutions here. Um, and again, um, uh, the octree structure is defined based on the input point cloud, and in the decoder, we just copy the octree structure from the encoder because we know exactly where the 3D information uh, should be stored, should be placed in the output. Right? So, um, like uh, octrees at the same level are, are the same. So here. Um, we see a clear improvement in performance. So here, going from 64 cube to 256 cube, we have about 10% uh, uh, of IOU improvement. And that's clear because um, for this task, uh, this task inherently depends on the resolution, right? If we have a two-cores uh, re representation, then we lose just by default. Okay, so far I've talked about um, like a classification and a semantic 3D uh, segmentation. And... Uh, um, I haven't talked yet about how we can solve the original Defner fusion problem. So this is, uh, in this, uh, this is a, a problem we tackle in this, in this paper here. Let's recap again the uh, traditional approaches. So um, the standard volumetric fusion approach from Curtis and Levoy is to basically take the uh, 2.5D depth maps um, and compute this implicit surface representation, which is basically um, for every voxel in the 3D space, I want to get the distance to the closest surface and I do this for all the views, and then I just average that information. Okay, this is, uh, this is the formulas for this, so it's very simple. Um, so the advantage of this uh, method, it's, it's simple, it's fast, it's very easy to implement. It's de facto the gold standard algorithm for many pipelines. But it, has, it comes with a couple of disadvantages. First of all, it requires many redundant views to actually reduce noise, and it can't, ha can't handle outliers. We're just merged into reconstruction. It can also not complete missing surfaces. Here you see an example. Left is the ground truth reconstruction. On the right is the reconstruction using the Curlis and Levoy volumetric fusion approach um, based on four noisy input images. And you can see, while it maintains the, the details, it also has a lot of noise. A second uh, baseline approach is the so-called TVL1 fusion approach, the total variation 
with the L1 norm, a regularizer fusion approach. This is an approach where you have a simple prior, so you know something about the world, but the prior is extremely simple. The prior just tells you the surface area should be small. And then you can, uh, can optimize this using uh, a total variation method. So this leads to a significant noise reduction, but it also <clears throat> over, over smooths the edges of uh, the object, as you can see here. And it, and it also, importantly, removes some of the details that are, that are just very thin and noisy. So the simplistic local prior is not good enough to represent, to capture the complexity of the world, because it just tells us you should uh, have an output reconstruction with a small surface. And it also cannot reason about missing surfaces, obviously. Um, now, uh, this is the output of the learned approach, um, where we learn uh, noise suppression from data, uh, and we can also learn about su surface completion from data. Um, the disadvantage of this approach is that uh, we need large 3D data sets, but they become increasingly available these days. And also the question is, how can we scale this now to high resolution? And this is where this OCNET representation comes in that I was talking about before. So um, the naive way of solving this problem is the following. We use the same unit architecture as in the semantic segmentation case. The input here is basically, for instance, it could be the truncated sign distance function, so the implicit surface representation derived with the Curlis and Levoy approach, and the output uh, is then compared against the, the ground truth, either in terms of occupancy or, or sign distance function. The input could also be something more complex that we use in practice, like some high order statistics which capture the ambiguity between different viewpoints. So this uh, seems simple, uh, but it has a significant problem. <clears throat> the problem with this approach is um, that the octree structure here, in contrast to the semantic segmentation example from before, is actually unknown and needs to be inferred as well. Because the inputs are very noisy, we cannot use the inputs to tessellate the 3D space, to adaptively divide the 3D space, because we would end up with a very dense representation, right? Um, so we need to learn this, um, this adaptation of the octree uh, during inference, basically. We need to adapt it during inference. And this is the architecture that we, that we uh, came up with. It uh, borrows ideas from the um, uh, reconstruction literature, where typically reconstructions are um, processed coarse to fine, also because uh, of memory limitations. So we first try to predict the output at a 64 cube resolution, then at a 128 cube resolution, and then at 256. And uh, similarly, we scale the input. And then basically, within each of these levels of resolutions, we have a, a unit to capture local context, and we, we uh, scale the features up to the next level, and at the same time, we predict the octree structure based on the current prediction of the reconstruction. So uh, we take the, basically, we take the reconstruction, we look at the zero level set, and then we define a band around that zero level set where we want to split, where we want to further refine. Right? And we do this several times. We train this um, course to fine and then fine tune it end to end the whole architecture. So here are some results. Um, this is similar to what you've seen before um, for an airplane example here. <clears throat> so um, different resolutions here um, on, in the rows and the columns are the, the uh, volumetric fusion approach, which is very noisy. The TVL1 approach, which is um, you know, less noisy, but misses a lot of details um, than our reconstruction uh, and compared to the ground truth. We can also do surface uh, or 3D completion with this approach. So um, this is, uh, on the left is a baseline approach. This is our model and this is the ground truth. What we do here is basically, we have the ground truth for the full 3D model, but the observation is only from one camera. So we have a lot of occlusions which we need to reason about. So for instance, here, this part here is completely occluded, right? So in this case, we do a better job than the baseline, but still, like, there's some deviation to the ground truth, as you can see here in the occluded regions, because it's basically uh, guessing.